This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Hi, everyone. People often ask how they can support more great stories from The Wild, and we really appreciate your asking. Thank you. Uh, the Wild is a joint production of myself and KUOW Public Radio, and you can support this vital work and become part of The Wild community by checking out our show notes. There you'll find information about supporting my wildlife organization, Chris Morgan Wildlife, through Patreon. Help fuel the next adventure. Okay, enjoy the episode, guys. We have a special treat for you today. Back in May, I had a conversation with wildlife biologist Dr. Ray Wynne Grant. It was a live event on YouTube. Thanks to all of you who joined us that evening and for your really wonderful comments. If you weren't able to make it, here's your chance. We're sharing the full conversation with you here today. And I'd like to thank my friends over at Conservation Northwest for sponsoring this event. Dr. Raywin Grant is a fellow bear nerd, so you can believe me we talked about bears. But we also talked about access to nature and ways to remove barriers so everyone can feel comfortable and connected to wilderness. I had a lovely time speaking with Ray. She's one of the best science communicators I've ever met. I'm sure you'll love her as well. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Chris Morgan, host of the Wild Podcast from KUOW Public Radio in Seattle. It's good to be here. I'm super excited. This is going to be a wonderful event, and I'm glad that you could make it wherever you are in the world. I hope you're somewhere comfortable. Today, I'm talking to uh, Dr. Ray Wynne Grant. Uh, Ray is a large carnivore ecologist and a fellow with the National Geographic Society. She's also a research faculty member at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And the blend of her work is, is really fascinating. For 15 years, she studied the behavior and ecology of black bears and African lions, among many other species. And she does it with this backdrop of, of social justice as an advocate for women and people of color in the sciences. She's one of the most effective science communicators I've seen. And oh yeah, Dr. Ray Wayne Grant has degrees from Columbia, Yale, and Emory. That's all. <laughs> what? So Ray, welcome. I'm so delighted that you're here. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be in your presence, Chris. This is just a dream come true. So I know we're going to have tons of fun. Your background and your connection to nature, I, I, I always like to think that we're all born with what I call a nature mm -hmm, gene. Mm -hmm. I call it. And, you know, some have this nature gene stronger than others. Um, did you have a strong nature gene as a kid? Oh, absolutely I did, but in a super non-traditional way, Chris. So I, I have so many colleagues who are in conservation or in, you know, different types of wildlife sciences, and they grew up, you know, going hiking or camping and, you know, experiencing animals in their natural habitats. And I didn't have that. I was born in San Francisco. I always lived in big cities with my family. We did not recreate in nature very often, if at all. Um, and yet I loved nature because of the media and TV. And I would watch nature shows. And I would just sit in my grandparents' floor and just watch, you know, in particular PBS shows you know, over and over and over. And I remember specifically seeing the jungle and feeling very much like, I want to go there. I want to go to the jungle and I want to see jaguars in the jungle. And I didn't know what the jungle was. I didn't necessarily know where it was. I definitely didn't know that I was being introduced to science because for me, it was entertainment. It was like a really nice way to spend a Saturday afternoon. And yet I just knew this was for me. And so for a long time before I knew about the science behind it, my goal as a kid was to be a nature show host because I knew it would take me there to those places. How and then as I you realized that, what, oh, you when you're six, like, that's what I want to be. Six, really? seven. Yeah. I used to tell my parents and, 
And unfortunately, you know, what happens to a lot of girls, it happened to me where once I got around middle school, I started telling myself, oh, I don't belong in science or my grades aren't strong enough for me to, you know, to be that type of explorer. Maybe I should, you know, be a teacher or a musician or something a little more in the box. But by the time I got to college, my passion reemerged and I felt like, you know what, there is a science to this nature show stuff. And also there is um, a huge purpose. You know, I, I was really introduced to the idea that we can actually save these species that are endangered. We can save them from going extinct if we work hard enough, if we innovate the science well enough. And so once I realized that there was this like added purpose to it, I was completely hooked. And I really haven't looked back since that day. I think uh, that's super powerful. You know, when you think about that imagery I'm always amazed when really young kids are really hooked on and drawn into wildlife documentaries. Mm -hmm. and, and I've watched lots of kids watch lots of them and they just, they absorb it. They love it. They're naturally predisposed to watching it. It's powerful mm -hmm. stuff. My influence was, was David Attenborough back home, you know, and yeah. watched him when I was seven years old. A legend. It's powerful stuff, isn't it? You know, and it, it's, I love hearing the story. Something else you just said as well was that, that, you feel like watching those shows was introduce, introducing you to ecology and science, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting, that, that's like a little unexpected, isn't it? When as a child, you're watching that stuff, but you had a realization, did you, that that's what you were learning? Oh yeah, absolutely. And not all science is really made for television or media, right? Like there, there's all different kinds of sciences in the world that are super interesting, but may not be very well visually communicated. So I'm really fortunate that the type of science that I love the most is perfect for television, you know, perfect for all kinds of different shows because my passion was really ignited just by like sitting around and being entertained. It was a, it was a passive kind of informal education that transformed my life. And I think transforms many people's lives and interests. What a great thing to, to soak up, right? Just through osmosis. I got to ask though, um, what about the bears? I mean, you touched upon it earlier in Nevada. Why bears? Uh, how did you how did you find and then feed your passion for bears in particular? Yeah, I hope I'm not letting anyone down here when I admit this, but I kind of accidentally became a bear biologist. And it was because I, you know, I really threw myself into school. I started graduate school. I did, you know, an undergraduate program on um lion ecology. And then I did a master's degree where I was living in Tanzania, studying lions, very hands-on. And when I started my PhD, I thought, oh, for sure, I'm just going to continue this East Africa work. Lions are my thing, you know, big cats, large carnivores in Africa. And my advisors really helped me realize that for the project I wanted to do, I really needed to be quite hands-on with a species and also be able to really observe them for a long time. So as much as I loved conservation, which is action, right, which is like getting in there, saving the species, designing a program to bring them back, my ecology program really meant that I needed to like collect data and not intervene in what I was seeing and really observe for, for years at a time. And ethically, that's not really what you want to do when a species is on the brink of extinction. You want to get in there, you want to make some changes. So my advisors are actually the people who introduced me to the idea of studying black bears, a non-endangered species in North America. So they said, you can either keep your species of lions and change your research questions or change your species and keep your research questions. And so that's how I got hooked on black bears. And ever since okay. then, I've been studying them and it's absolutely been amazing. That's so cool. Cause I've mm -hmm. got a similar story where I change species but it's a bit funnier than yours. <laughs> Right. So people, I'm the bear expert, right? But mm -hmm. I had a master's degree. I got a master's degree and I wanted to go and study grizzly bears. There wasn't a project I could dive into and I only had a year and a half to do this master's degree. So my, my professor said to me, you could switch species. So I did. And I, I didn't switch to another bear species or another big carnivore. I switched to red squirrels. So I did, <laughs> I did, I did my master's degree on red squirrels. So it was like a grizzly bear study. <laughs> miniaturized radio mm -hmm. collar trapping home ranges food activities all the rest of it you know so I, I i love your story that when you can but i love yours too because what a lot of people don't realize is that you know in ecology and behavior and movement of animals 
you know, it's fun to do like the big charismatic, amazing species, but understanding what the little guys are doing and how they operate is really important information and we can scale it up, you know, to so many other species. So it's, you know, the squirrels are really important. I love it. Thank you. That makes me feel better. <laughs> I know that you are deeply involved in some really amazing cutting edge research in various parts of the world and you're doing, you're doing work uh, on grizzly bears right now, or have you started it, that project that's uh, stretching out into the prairies? It sounds fascinating. Yeah, and I, you know, this is great because I can give a shout out to my colleagues at the American Prairie Reserve in eastern Montana. And we're doing all kinds of work to restore the American Great Plains and in particular the northern Great Plains. They used to be wild areas with elk and bison and wolves and grizzly bears, and they may again be that wild. And so groups like APR are doing an amazing job restoring wildlife there. And my job actually is to look at the historic diet of grizzly bears. So 200 years ago, 300 years ago, before white settlement of the Great Plains, I'm looking at what were grizzly bears eating? I think they're eating a lot of bison. Um, but they were also eating a lot of different plant species, you know, eggs, insects, and I'm doing what we call a stable isotope analysis. So looking at chemicals that we can find in skin and hair of, you know, ancient grizzly bears to figure out what they were eating and then to wow. compare it to what's available on the landscape today. Oh, the hypothesis is that if they were eating a lot of bison and a lot of native grasses, we have enough of those uh, food resources there today. So that really means the landscape is ready for the return of grizzlies. That's fascinating. Basically looking at comparing historical times and present times. And exactly. if, it, if, if it's good now, like it was back then, then it could work for bears. And if it's not, we've got to re re figure the scenario. We have out. some work to do, yeah. And it's all through hair. So if anyone out there by any chance has a, you know, bear skin rug or something like that from, couple hundred years ago in Montana, please just take a snip of hair for me, send it in the mail, because it's an incredible amount of data that I can glean from that. That's so awesome. Citizen <laughs> science, send your bear hair this way, guys. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, we've got a mama bear, sorry, not Ray, mama bear. We've, right. got a, we've got a couple of questions here. Ellen asks, okay. how does one handle such bears in the wild without the mama bear getting angry? I guess that's, that's the obvious question. And possibly <laughs> you or your team harm so back to the bear capture back to the bear cub se sequence there right yes i'm so glad you asked because i guess i didn't go into enough detail there that we use sedatives so the same kinds of sedatives that we might use on a human being if they're having any kind of medical procedure we sedate the mama bear because otherwise she would kill us and she'd get really stressed out in the process. And we're trying to minimize any type of stress to any of these animals. So actually what we do while she's hibernating is we do like an army crawl like this towards the den. And we'll have a stick, we call it a jab stick, but it looks like the end of a broomstick. And on the end is a little needle with a little syringe with some sedatives in it. And we just poke her in the shoulder like you were getting your flu shot at the doctor. She gets poked in the shoulder, she doesn't hate it. It's just a little tiny prick. And then within about five minutes, she's fully asleep, snoring away. We're able to just take the cubs. We do not sedate the cubs, they're too little. Um, handle them, process them, just get their information, put them all right back. When the sedative wears off of the mother, she's still hibernating in her den. It's like it never happened. I love it. I love it. And they're used to long, deep sleeps anyway, right? They are. And I make it sound easy. Of course, it's not that easy, but essentially it's very straightforward, the process. I love it. Guys, if you're just joining us, if you're a little late or, or uh, just entering the conversation, I'm with Dr. Ray Wynn Grant and we're talking about bears and beyond here and loving it. If you've got questions, throw them into the comments section and we'll get to as many of them as possible. Ray, I want to move on to, to the theme kind of of it's sort of getting back into nature and you know it's been a difficult year for, for everybody on the on the planet mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's some really just really tragic sad times emotionally really difficult for people not being able to get out um it's affected everyone in different ways and our hearts go out to those who've, who've lost loved ones and yeah. who've been affected. Has COVID affected your work? I, I, it's affected a lot of people who spend time in the field or travel a lot, field biologists and others who travel. Has it affected mm -hmm. your, how has it affected your work? 
Yes, absolutely. And, and I really appreciate what you said about the suffering that a lot of people in our community have gone through. That's absolutely the case. Um, it has affected my work tremendously, and I am finding it a bit ironic because one thing is true that that nature and the outdoors and the wilderness is a pretty safe place to be during COVID times, and that's where I do my work. So ironically, I haven't been able to do my field work because of COVID because of the travel required to get to those wilderness areas and those nature spaces. I don't necessarily live in the areas that I have been working in. And so under other circumstances, you know, camping in the wilderness and, you know, hiking all day is a great way and a safe way to spend your time. So for any of, of the listeners here, if you have that accessible to you, please absolutely get out there via nature. But it has definitely interrupted my work. I have to say it hasn't been devastating. I'm very, very fortunate. I know that there are other folks who have lost a year of research and data collection. I'm really fortunate because so much of my data collection is the locations from the GPS on a bear collar. And those bear collars are still working. They're still taking location fixes, even when I'm not there. <laughs> Into the laptop. I mean, so to explain it, there's a bear that has a GPS collar. It's, it's not yeah. unlike what's on our cell phones. And it sends a signal to a satellite in outer space. And then that sends a signal back to my laptop, which tells me the location of the bear about every four hours. And so although some batteries have died, I've lost some callers out there, for many of them, they're still active, they're still collecting data, and I'm just so fortunate. I haven't been able to visit my bears, I didn't get to do the den checks this year, but they all seem to be doing just fine. Probably a little happier that they don't have people all over the place monitoring them, actually. How many bears do you have online, as it were, on a GPS collar at a time, in, in just generally in any of your projects? Yeah, it depends on the project. It depends on the funding. You know, again, for any of you out there who have ever considered donating to a, you know, a conservation nonprofit or an academic project, please do, because the funding is what allows us to do this research. Um, the project that I worked on for the longest had about 13 collared bears at the same time. And then we would rotate it every year. So every year we'd take a collar off, put it on a new bear. And so over the course of about 10 years, we had many, 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 I mean, almost a hundred bears that were wow. collared and it was tons of data. It really was transformative for our understanding of conservation and of wildlife ecology in the area. It's like the more the merrier, you know, you can't have too many GPS collars out there. Now, you mentioned that you didn't grow up spending a lot of time in nature. It kind of came to you late. You're a mm -hmm. mom. You also mentioned that mm -hmm. of young kids. How do you share this right, reasonably new passion, right? I know it's been yeah. a lot of years now, but how do you share that, that passion for nature with, with your kids? I love this question. And I could use any and all advice from any other parents out there who go into the field, because I know that I don't do enough. Don't ask me. My, my kids kicked and screamed every time I dragged them into the forest. They're different now because they're grown, but it's awesome. But oh God, at the time I was like, oh, is this even worth it? <laughs> oh yeah, no, I get it. And I have, like, like you said, I have young children, so I still have some time to get them out there. Um, but because I study these predators and because I'm usually roughing it, I mean, I can be camping. I mean, I go on, you know, month long camping expeditions. Sometimes I don't generally bring my children to my field work. So that means I leave home. I leave my family at home and I go away by myself and I do my projects and I come back. That's working for now. It requires a lot of support on the home front, but it's working for now. But now that my oldest daughter has a little more energy and a little more experience, we have been going hiking like crazy and she loves it. She's an excellent hiker. She has tons of energy. She's so curious and she has self-declared without pressure from me, she's decided that she wants to be a nature scientist when she grows up. So I could not be more excited. I couldn't be more excited. I personally think she might be like a, a you know, rocket engineer or something like that or an astronaut but for now she's staying a nature scientist and it's great so she clearly has your nature gene as well right she does yeah i love that what do you notice in her when you're out and about that makes you realize it what's she doing you know she's different from me in that 
she's so fascinated with the small things. You know, she wants to look at the ants and she wants to look at the, you know, the earthworms and she wants to look at the caterpillars and like insects really fascinate her. And I wonder, is it because she's tiny, you know, she's closer to the ground and that's why she's interested in it. But she, you know, she loves mud and she loves kind of getting her hands dirty. Whereas me, I'm more of like seeking the destination. You know, I want to like really put my body into it and get somewhere where she wants to like find a space and settle into a space and just, you know, in like a one square meter, you know, box, like figure out what's there and how is it working? And it's really amazing. I think we complement each other really well. Yeah, both scales there kind of thing. It'll be interesting to see what she goes into if she does stick with wildlife and mm -hmm. nature. Right? And maybe it will be an entomologist because she can study all in one square yard. Absolutely. Ants. I, I mean, an ant specialist. I started with ants. That's where my passion was. Mm -hmm. From a very young age, it was ants. I've got all these pictures my dad used to take of me as a tiny kid with these tiny ants, just fascinated with them. And then somehow it became grizzly bears and, and other big creatures, but I still have that ant passion. I could sit and watch them all day. You know, it's uh, that's the message I think, right? Isn't it that there are, you know, nature is everywhere. It can be in the crack of a sidewalk. You know, you don't have to Absolutely. be in the deep wilderness to get this connection with nature, right? Absolutely. There's, I mean, there's, it's everywhere. And a lot of us feel, or, or a lot of us are made to feel like we have to go search for nature. We have to leave our homes, leave our hometowns, you know, to go on an, a, a big adventure, you know, a big deliberate adventure in order to access nature. But really, you know, in the cracks of the sidewalks, like you're saying, you know, in the local park or playground, you know, even if you have a garden hanging off your apartment balcony, you know, nature is here with us it's it's all around us and there are little tiny adventures or big giant expeditions and everything in between is worthy of you know that respect and that attention and mm -hmm. i wish i had realized that at a younger age because i think i missed out on a lot um, of nature exploration in urban spaces you know i grew up in urban spaces and i didn't take my first hike in nature until i was 20 years old but I could have been, I could have been really diving in and learning more in my own spaces. And that's something that I preach today, far and wide. But you, you got there, it might have taken you longer than childhood, but you got there and that's inspiring as well. The other thing that I find inspiring about your story is that you did get there when you were 20. Because mm -hmm. I think I have a daughter who's 20 and, and 19. And, you know, kids are trying to find their path. And especially in this, this difficult, weird year and school and university, mm -hmm. nothing's normal mm -hmm. anymore. Right. But mm -hmm. I think your story is wonderful because you can get to 20 years old and then find your path because it wasn't yeah. it wasn't in your imagination, was it, when you were 20 to be doing what you're doing now? Right. Right. Um, I. I, I encounter a lot, you know, now I'm based at a university, so I encounter a lot of 20 year olds, 19 year olds, a lot of people who have this assumption that it's too late for them to get involved, that they need to have experience already. You know, and I try to tell them, you know, it's never too late to start. There is no too late, you know, and also 20 is young, <laughs> first of all. Yeah. But, you know, when it comes to a passion, especially for nature, what matters the most is your dedication and your ideas and your willingness to really dive in and be helpful in protecting this planet. What matters the least is how much experience you have or when you started or when you decided that it was for you. You know, we're like, we're on a mission to save the planet and it can be, you know, through wildlife conservation, it can be through exploration, it could be through inventions, all these things. It doesn't matter when you get into it. What matters is that you are into it and that you feel supported and that you are willing to contribute your ideas. And that really brings us to a conversation about diversity and inclusion and who's at the table and who's participating and who's empowered, you know, to be a part of these movements. And that's also something near and dear to me and something that I realized, you know, quite late in life. But again, it's not too late for everyone to participate all inclusive exactly we're all inhabitants of this one planet and i want to dive into that with you in this next section after we get a couple of, of, uh, of questions from listeners here um i don't want to keep you all to myself here ray so i've got to keep remembering to go to these questions earlier you referenced this is from charlie earlier you referenced citizen science are there opportunities for average citizens especially those of us who are extremely outdoorsy 
to help with research? Great question. And oh, I love right this. in line with what you were just describing. This is about everyone getting involved, one planet to protect, right? Yeah, and 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 there's an easy way, and I kind of preach this far and wide. The best thing you can do, whether you have tons of money or just a little bit, vote. There is always, always a candidate, a law, some type of legislation in the ballot box that you can vote on that is pro or anti-environment. And so, or pro or anti-research. You know, we've seen in plenty of administrations recently around the world that there are candidates who block scientific research, you know, who block a lot of this innovation. And if you can do anything as a citizen, you can vote in favor of the environment always, in favor of science and research always. That helps the most. And then second, there's this great thing called citizen science, also called community science that's out there. There's so many different platforms out there where you can upload your own data into these huge cloud-based databases that show us where you saw an animal, whether it was a squirrel or a bear, you know, or a mountain lion or a, you know, a little gopher, whatever it might have been, you can upload that information and really contribute to ecologists' understanding of where these animals are when us ecologists aren't out there in the field looking for them. It's um, crazy, isn't it? Right? This this little thing that everybody has in their pocket these yeah. days, this little mini yeah. computer can connect us all and enable everybody to be a part. I love how you're saying that. It's like everyone can be a part of the data collection just just yes. through this in your pocket in your everyday life, right? There are so many apps, and I, I don't want to necessarily highlight one over another, but if you just do a search for nature apps or, you know, citizen science, community science apps, there are so many ways that you can actually be a data collector yourself. Um, yep. And it's really, it's amazing. It's really changed how we do research, who does research, who's contributing and who's benefiting. I've got to say, Charlie said that he's uh, uh, the, the person who gave us that question, extremely outdoorsy, which is awesome because there's also roles for those people, people who mm -hmm. are um, uh, experienced enough get deep into the back country. And we were just doing an episode on Wolverines on the slopes of Mount Rainier. That type of project here in Washington state uses citizen science all the time, getting people out literally in their snowshoes and hiking and checking remote cameras. And there are programs like that. Great group here, Conservation yeah. Northwest in, in Seattle does exactly that kind of work and works with small teams of really dedicated outdoorsy people to get them into the far flung wilderness. So either extreme is possible, definitely. Totally. And I also want to say, you know, Charlie, I believe it was who asked the question, asked specifically about, you know, research. But something I want to say is that, you know, being out on a hiking trail isn't actually available to everyone. There are people who are too young, too old, you know, who don't have the necessary physical abilities or differing physical abilities to do that. And yet there are so many roles to play in wildlife conservation. We need educators, we need artists, we need science communicators, we need, you know, coders and, you know, data engineers. There's so many different ways to participate in wildlife conservation beyond being the person out with the backpack away from your family, you know, in the field. And I have found what works for me, but I have so many friends who are, you know, artists, you know, who sketch, who paint, who draw, who make, you know, nature come alive for people who are not necessarily based in the wild. And all of those ways to contribute and participate are so, so, so important. So any skill you have, honestly, I think can be leveraged for wildlife conservation. And so we need anyone and everyone. So, so well said. So well said. Okay, someone here is calling you Dr. Mama Bear. Uh, <laughs> uh, Carmen, maybe? Carmen, Dr. Mama Bear, do you have a personal observation of increased wildlife activity over the past year when humans were less present? Great question. Sure, yeah. You know, I read the news headlines like everyone else. And so I was able to notice, you know, those places in Japan or those places in, you know, even like the New York harbors where we were seeing you know, wildlife showing up in places where they weren't always because there was so high density of human activity. Um, so yes, the answer is yes, absolutely. I know the national parks last summer and last fall really saw increased movement of wild animals, in particular large mammals, um, in the spaces. So animals spent more time on roads because roads were safer for them. Animals really ranged further than they normally do. But 
I don't think we should get too excited about that. This is my personal belief because we don't want, you know, COVID to continue. We're going to get back outside. We're going to get back to exploring and we're going to have to really figure out how we can do what we need in nature, access nature, recreate in nature in a way that is safe and sustainable for these wild animals. So they got this great break from us. And I'm hoping that what we can find is balance. I don't think we can get back to summer 2020 where nature was open and available, but I think we can find much more balance, which can help all of us. Right, perhaps what it was was a reminder about that very balance that we all need to strike, right? Even if we don't yeah. get back to the quietness of mid 2020. Yeah. I swear I was hearing more birds. Maybe it was just quiet as I was hearing them more. <laughs> or it seemed like there were more of them around, especially this time last year, spring, when the, the sky and sounds are just full of them singing, you know, and uh, it was really noticeable. Um, I think for us as human beings to remember that time and strive as much as we can towards it, like you say. Exactly. Without setting our expectations too high, but dreaming for, for doing right by wildlife is a good reminder. Exactly. That coexistence, you know, is a huge goal and coexistence that makes us feel good and makes wild animals feel good. We haven't hit it yet. You know, we've had these different extremes, but figuring out how to coexist so that everyone is thriving is a huge goal, kind of an ultimate goal of conservation scientists, you know, and so if anyone has ideas, you know, any idea, any person, any thinker belongs in these spaces to try to figure it out, because I think we can get there. Coexistence, you just mentioned. Uh, we're going back and forth between some questions here, and it's related to coexistence, but it's a little bit back to bears. Uh, okay. <laughs> I like the name of this person, Daily Walkabout is their, <laughs> is their handle. Daily Walkabout asks, <laughs> my partner and I love to recreate in the wild. When in bear country, what's the best way to stay safe? Is bear spray necessary? What would your response to that be, Ray? Okay, I'm going to give my response and then Chris, make sure you chime in too. So yes, it is necessary. Yes, bear spray. In fact, I just... I have to say, I was looking around at my desk here because I usually have bear spray within reach so I can show people on camera what it looks like. You can buy bear spray online. You know, I get mine on Amazon. However you get it, get it. Remember that you can't fly with bear spray, so do not pack it in your bag. But yes, it's necessary. Even if you're in a place that is black bear territory, it keeps you safe. It's for emergency use and it's never a bad idea to have it. I always carry bear spray with me. I've had my scariest interactions with bears when I haven't had my bear spray with me. So yes, absolutely. I would also say that um, being in groups is a really great way to stay safe from bears. You know, hiking by yourself is beautiful. It's special. It's great alone time. But if you're doing that, make sure you're making a bunch of noise. Sing to yourself, talk to yourself, bang some sticks together, because usually these animals hear us before we even know that they're around. And more often than not, they just book it out of there. There's probably been millions of times that you've been out on a hike or on a walk and you had no idea that there were bears or mountain lions or you know anything like that nearby. Usually we find that if you're in a group of two or more, you're not going to have um, an incident with a wild animal because you're making noise. Um, bringing a dog with you, any of these things is, you know, it's really easy to stay safe. Also, if you run into an animal, don't provoke them. So there's this, you kind of have to humble yourself. You'll either get big and scary where you take your jacket off, you hold it over your head, you make a lot of noise while backing away slowly, or you put your eyes down. You're either looking at the animal's feet or above its head. You try not to make eye contact with the predator because that signals that you're prey, right? Like the deer in the headlights look, deers just kind of lock in and make eye contact. And that sends a signal to the predator. You look down, you look up, you back away slowly and you really show that you are not an aggressive person. You're not there to cause a problem. People usually survive interactions with wild animals, including bears and mountain lions. More often than not, they make it out alive because they get out of there and they signal that they're safe and they're non-threatening. I love that because you mixed in it's, it's as much about respecting the animal and the space that you're walking into, isn't it, right? And understanding the animals and their behavior and, and the scenarios you might go through. I'm constantly running through scenarios in my head when I'm on a trail. 
Absolutely. Some people say that sounds exhausting, but I actually find it really stimulating because you start looking at the environment through an animal's eyes, like a bear or a mountain lion or those creatures that are more capable physically than us. And it makes you think differently. It makes you look, at, makes you notice a, a stone turned over at the side of a trail or a little bit of hair that's stuck on a sure. tree. Or yeah. Kind of opens the world being safe in bear country and, and around other carnivores, doesn't it? Do you feel the same thing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm almost always, if I'm in the wilderness, I'm almost always looking for an animal. I'm usually there purposefully looking for an animal. So yeah, the scenarios are always in my head because we're walking forward, but they can be on this side, this side behind us. You know, they could be way ahead of us. They could have smelled us. I mean, there's so many different ways that we might interact with a wild animal. And I, I'm like you, Chris, where I just love thinking about what could happen, what might be happening that I don't know about, you know, everything. It's really engaging. And it's also really calming. You know, it, it helps me feel calm to feel prepared. But for the average person recreating in nature, again, I don't want you to make tons of noise. I don't want you to be disruptive, you know, to these peaceful ecosystems. It's a, but tricky, make, balance, it? it's a tricky balance. Make enough noise that you feel like an animal could hear you if you were approaching. And it's, time, it's, it's an opportunity to just channel your inner crazy and speak to yourself. Talk, <laughs> talk to, to yourself. yourself. You I love it. In the grocery store, but you can on your own on a yeah. trail, right? Just let yes. it all out, you know, quietly. Yes. Sing quietly. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I heard someone say, a few people have said this to me about bear spray, and I totally, I, I just want to echo everything that you've said, Ray, the importance of carrying bear spray in bear mm -hmm. country. Don't mm -hmm. leave it at home. Far mm -hmm. more effective than anything else that you might carry. And, but several people have said to me, oh, I carry it all the time. I've never needed it. That's like crazy talk. That's like yeah. saying, well, you know, I, every time I cross the road, I look left and right. I've never been hit yet. So I'm not going right. to, I'm just going to stop looking. You know, it's like, exactly. The, keep the logic clear, carry it because the time you need it, it's going to be there for you. And it's highly effective stuff, isn't it? Exactly. And also if you, you know, if you're really concerned with the animal, remember bear spray is, you know, it's, it's pepper spray, essentially. It will not permanently damage the animal. It irritates their eyes and their nose so that they want to go away and get some water, but it's not anything that's going to cause any type of permanent harm, but it will save your life or save you from being hurt. So it's always a good idea. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. Um, God, you communicate so uh just so clearly Ray it's just an incredible <laughs> was there was there someone who made you realize in life that you had uh, an important voice to share um yes I, you know I I gosh there have been multiple people who've been incredibly encouraging of me um but mostly myself mostly myself. I really struggled a lot. Um, I, you know, in my intro, you said I went to this university and this university. I've done a lot of school and I'm really proud of myself, but I've also, I always struggled with my grades. You know, I have to say just because I went to these schools doesn't mean I was getting straight A's. I have failed classes. I have repeated classes. I have gotten angry calls from my advisors saying that, you know, I'm borderline going to get kicked out of school. I have never been that super high straight A student, you know, that high performer, but I've tried, you know, so that means that like when I show up for the test, I have studied hard, I have tried my best, but it might not necessarily be reflected in my grades. But what I seemed to feel way more comfortable with was talking, you know, and so I even found that like if I needed to write a science paper or figure out a presentation, if I just took out my phone and recorded myself talking, it would flow, it would just kind of come out. And mm. I, 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 I guess it's natural in me. I, you know, I don't necessarily know where it came from. I haven't been trained in science communication or any type of communication, but I have had way fewer nerves when it comes to talking about science than I've had when it comes to kind of 
um, being evaluated on my science. And I always do my best, but one is way more natural for me. So when I realized that I could both do research and also talk about the research or talk about the outcomes or talk about how it relates to the public, you know, I really set off trying and it was a very, very bumpy road. These days I, I have a lot more opportunities like this one with you, Chris, to talk about science, to talk about nature in the media. But when I first tried to emerge from that kind of pure science research bubble, I didn't have a lot of support. And, and I worked with institutions that really didn't appreciate my science communication work and strategies. So how I- how, how did you change that? I really, you know, I really had to take some tough bets on myself. Um, I really had to spend time betting on myself. And when I did, I, you know, found friends and colleagues at PBS Nature, at National Geographic, you know, at all these other kind of science communication organizations that saw in me what I saw in myself and that valued it. And so, and so tell me more about that. How did, how did that manifest? How did you draw on that energy and believe in yourself enough at those essential times in life to, to push what you were feeling? Oh, it was so hard. There was, there was a, a season, I will call it, in my life where I just took a lot of risks. I did a lot of things that I never thought I'd be doing. I changed relationships. I changed jobs. I changed cities. I did a lot of things in my early 30s, you know, that I never thought I would be doing, but I felt so sure that I could make it, that I could do it, that I could be not just an academic and not just a media person, but someone doing both. And I had so few examples of that, but I felt, I felt like I, I, like I could, like it was missing out there. And, you know, and it, so I had to, you know, and I don't feel ashamed these days, but for a while I felt ashamed of formally stepping out of academia. You know, I took two years, just two years, but it felt like a lifetime where I stopped working in academia and worked squarely in science communication. And those two years absolutely changed my life. And now I'm back in academia very confidently as an academic, a researcher, a scholar, and a science communicator. Mm, and mm. and I'm owning it. Prove, right, right. Proving I'm, that it's yeah. good, good at it and it can be done, that mixture. Absolutely. And I have to say... I did it the hard way. There are so many amazing folks out there who are doing it, you know, in their 20s and their teens. You know, social media is a great place for folks to launch. And so now I have a roster of all these amazing science communicators who, you know, never had that imposter syndrome and didn't have to go through the horrors of, you know, like leaving jobs and taking risks. They're just very naturally doing it from the beginning. And I love that. Because again, it plays a huge role in who's included in wildlife conservation, who feels seen in it, and how people understand, you know, what scientists are doing. We need more science communication, not less. I, I think it makes you, I don't know if you look at yourself like this, but it sounds like it makes you brave. You sound very brave. I, yeah, I've been through it. I think a lot of people might think that my bravery comes from, you know, staring wild animals in the face <laughs> by myself in the middle of the wilderness, but it actually so comes from bravery is something else. It's something else. It's from, you know, the professional risks I've taken and the hard conversations I've had with people and the non-traditional path, pa professional path that I've taken. That's where the bravery really comes, you know, like not seeing a blueprint for my career, but doing it anyway. And I'm really appreciative. And at the same time, I don't want it to be that hard for other people. I really want other people to be able to, you know, choose what they want to do, even if it's non-traditional and get there sooner and way with way less pain along the way. Yeah, the dog agrees as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's my dog. <laughs> Just the voice of support from the dog. <laughs> Based on everything you've just said, Ray, um, it can be tricky being a scientist, right? Because scientists are supposed to be neutral, supposed mm -hmm. to be, you know, scientific, objective. Yeah. Um, how do you balance this uh, in, in your life between being a scientist and, and being an, an advocate for wildlife? I, I, I uh, think about that a lot in my own work. And I'm, 
I'm curious, how, how do you balance it? Um, do you feel like some conversations with some people have weighed one way and others at the other way? Can you always be both? How, how do you balance that? You know, it's a great question, Chris, and I'm still figuring it out in a lot of ways because I truly believe that, I don't necessarily know if I believe that science is neutral, but I believe that res scientific results are scientific results and they should represent the truth. And so there have been situations where my scientific results actually support or something that I don't necessarily believe in, in terms of my core values. And, you know, I don't want any hunters to get angry with me, but an example is, you know, in, in the state of Nevada, um, when I first started doing research there, there was not a legal black bear hunting season, but my, me and my colleagues were doing research on the black bear population. And we were asked to produce some information that suggested whether the population and could handle a legalized uh, black bear hunt. And the question is, can the population handle it? And our answer was yes. It can't handle, you know, uh, hunting a hundred bears a year, but our, our work was able to show that if 20 or fewer bears were hunted a year, 20 or fewer, then the population would still be able to continue to increase. And I didn't want to see bear hunting happen in, in, in Nevada, but mm. I was able to say, these are the results of my work. It's right here. And, and so- how did, that, how did it feel then being the scientist with that information then having, to, did you have to communicate that to people as well? Yeah, so it had to be communicated. I really had to stand by those answers, you know, because that was my biology and that's what it showed. And so very often, I, and I learned this from, I have to give a shout out to Dr. Susan Clark at uh, the Yale School for the Environment, because she taught me, you know, more than 10 years ago to always clarify the lens through which I'm doing my communication. Mm. So if I am saying, you know, my lens is as a biologist, who believes in science, but also has a personal, you know, problem with hunting, then it's really important for me to state that because that's the lens through which I'm doing my work. I might not love the results, but I am committed to showcasing the truth always. And to me, that's what science is. Science is uncovering truth. And I have to stand by it. But it also means that I can choose not to engage in science if I feel that it is wildly violating my ethical beliefs. If I feel that there is something that could come of it that I would feel so strongly against. Um, and that hasn't happened yet, luckily. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. But you almost never know when it might happen, right? Because you can't predict the outcome of certain experiments. That's an interesting dilemma. Um, mm -hmm, wow. mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's almost a constant tension within me. Right. And and with uh, with climate change, you know, always impacting our work and with different, you know, changes in the environment, you know, it's something that we're always battling with. It's not easy to do science when you have morals and ethics and values to consider at the same time. So there's always kind of this inner conversation or a wider dialogue that has to happen. Um, and so, and so at a minimum, it's like an interesting intellectual exercise. And at a maximum, it can just be really distracting and really kind of emotionally tough. Wow. Yeah, this needs a couple of beers and about four hours of conversation, <laughs> this stuff. <doesn't> Agreed. It? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when it comes to science communication, you're one of the clearest out there. You know, it's just this mixture that you've got. Why do you think that it's important that we have scientists out there who can communicate well? And by that, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm hinting at the urgency that we all face. <laughs> what, what's your take on that? And, and can we do a better job of scientists becoming better communicators? Yes, we can do a better job. You know, I have to say that through all my schooling and all the training that I got, I never got science communication or communications training. And these days, you know, right now I'm part of, you know, UC Santa Barbara and the Bren School of Environmental Science, and they have a whole communications track. And it's new, it's brand new. But these days, scientists are being trained in science communication. And I think it's making all of the difference. And I think a lot of communicators are being trained in science, you know, and understanding scientific concepts. It goes both ways. And that's really different than how so many of us were brought up and were trained. You know, myself included, I'm a millennial, and yet I still had this very traditional training and upbringing. 
So science communication is so imperative. It, it impacts how people vote, how people behave, you know, whether they recycle or not, you know, whether they believe in climate change or not, whether they think that having bears in the ecosystem is a scary idea or a great idea. It impacts so, so, so much. Um, even how we understand weather, you know, hurricanes and tornadoes and, you know, floods and everything, how we understand our own world is really based on how well scientists are communicating the science. And right. so I feel, I feel great about the work that I've done, but I know that it's just in this tiny, tiny box. And so I really support all of the people out there who are dedicated to the communication, to access, to diversifying who's hearing all of these words. And I, you know, I call for more science communication across the board. I, amen to that. I love it. <laughs> and not a moment too soon for the for all of us on the planet, right? Yeah. You know, and just we we're faced with bad news a lot every day, and yeah. especially when it comes to the environment. I'm I'm personally an optimist, so I like to see the bright side and push for the wonder and things that we can change and things that we can manage and and, and do as individuals. Yeah. But um, how do you find hope? Give us a bit of inspiration about. How does, does Mama Bear find hope at times when <laughs> it, it might be difficult to find? Oh yeah, you know, it's so easy for me. And again, I'm just so privileged with having this awesome study species. Bears give a lot of hope. You know, the black bears and the grizzly bears of the world, they are rebounding from points of near extinction. So even just being amongst my study species, you know, learning about them, doing the research, it shows me that like, these populations are increasing. I also, you know, grew up at a time when we had some really serious crises, environmental crises, that we really made a dent in and started to solve. There was a hole in the ozone layer when I was a kid, and I remember panicking about it. But guess what? We figured out what was causing it, and collectively, as a society, we were able to stop doing those detrimental things and fix the hole in the ozone layer. You know, we had bald eagles were on the brink of extinction in our country for so long. And we figured out the chemicals that were causing their eggs to be too thin and we fixed it. And now bald eagles are all over the place. So I find that, again, you know, scientists really need to double down on telling the success stories, you know, showing how conservation and all of this science work and advocacy actually brings success. It actually keeps a lot of species on the planet and it keeps us healthy and balanced. And those stories along with the urgent stories of crisis can become more balanced so that we understand what we need to do to fix the problems. Let's do something together, Ray. I love let's, this. Let's. Right, let's, we've, got to, we've got to find some way to do something together. I love the way you express this stuff. Um, Thank you. Um, I was going to say something about, never mind, it's gone. I'm just down these rabbit holes. <laughs> Danielle has just written a comment more than, oh, this is really amazing, a, a comment more than a question. She says, an entire generation of little girls, I got goosebumps right now. She says, an entire generation of little girls, especially girls of color, will have you to thank. Thank you for everything you do, Ray. Oh, Aww. it's thank the perfect you, segue. Into, into this final segment of questions that I've got for you and perhaps the most important segment of questions. I know that so much of your work involves opening the doors and welcoming everybody into nature and conservation and making sure that everybody has equal opportunities to get out there and be a part of this wild planet and study it and love it and share it. And what, do you, what are some of the, in that role that you have, what are some of the misconceptions about what, why certain groups aren't involved in nature? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so glad you're bringing this up because this is a question that I got asked earlier in an interview today. And something that I really want to make sure people hear loud and clear that sometimes, and I'm going to speak primarily as a member of the Black community, that sometimes there is this perception that a lot of people of color don't participate in outdoor recreation or, you know, or out the outdoors and nature because of a lack of awareness of mm -hmm. the environment, of nature, of the outdoors. And that's absolutely not the case in general. You know, I'm sure in some specific cases that is the case, but, but there isn't a lack of awareness or lack of caring. Um, there was a group uh, called Green 2.0, which is based in the United States, that did a study 
And they were able to find that in the United States, at least, uh, communities of color, black and brown communities of color, were far more likely to vote in favor of the environment than white communities. So almost almost 100% of the time, people of color were voting for the environment, even though they weren't the ones necessarily recreating in it or working in it. But it was white communities that were about 50-50. They were really divided about whether or not they supported environmental legislation. And so it really showed that the awareness and the understanding of the power of the environment and the need to protect it and to experience it really rests in the white community, at least in the United States, rather than in communities of color. And if there's anything preventing people of color from, you know, for example, recreating in the outdoors, it's time, it's access, you know, it's it's money, it's a perception that we're not welcome or safe there, but it's not like a misunderstanding of how powerful and important nature is. And so that's a misconception that's really important to me to break down because, you know, I know my own family, my own Black family doesn't spend a lot of time in nature, but it's not because they don't understand or not aware of how magnificent it is because of a lot of systemic barriers to having leisure time and being able to use leisure time in that way. And so, so oh, go so ahead. People in that situation, Ray, that you've spoken to or work with or encourage, what do you say? What, how do you break some of those barriers that you've listed down to, 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 to open up nature to, for everybody? I, I do my best. <laughs> and there was a time when I would give some really kind of um, in the box kind of compartmentalized answers. And these days I'm feeling like it's a much more comprehensive kind of holistic battle that we all need to fight together. And I mean that, you know, if we work really, really, really hard to make the outdoors a safe and inclusive and accessible space, particularly for people of color, that's important, but it doesn't make a huge difference if as soon as those people of color leave the outdoors, they are in danger of being shot and killed or harassed or profiled because of their race, right? So if I have a great time at a national park, it doesn't make a big difference if I'm killed on the way home in the car from that national park. And so really, I feel like if we care about you know, promoting diversity in the sciences, you know, in the natural sciences and creating outdoor spaces that are safe for people of color and people from different oppressed backgrounds. That means we have to do that advocacy all over the place in every part of our lives and in every parts of our society. You know, it's really hard to figure out what type of ecologist you wanna be, what, you know, bear species you want to study if you face huge oppression in your normal life and in your community, you don't have that freedom to dream, you know? And so if we want all kinds of people participating in figuring out how to protect our planet and how to restore wildlife communities and to have this balanced, healthy, thriving planet, then we need to make sure that all kinds of people are protected and are safe and are thriving in every part of the world and every part of society so that they can be in the outdoors and they can contribute their ideas. Wow. It's wow. big, it's big, it's a big, it's a big initiative, but if we all work on it, especially people yeah. with privilege, then we'll get yeah. way, way closer. And all learn about it and all be aware of, of it. And the awareness has grown so markedly in recent years and yeah. because of tragedies and, and sadness, but hopefully, we can all move in the same direction together. I, I always think that maybe nature is a, is, a, is a level playing field as well, right? We're all from nature. Mm -hmm. We're all a part of nature, mm -hmm. not apart from nature. We're all a part of each other. We're all, you know, so maybe if we can nail it in the wild, right? Nail it out in nature where we all have this equal perception of each other, then it could be extremely powerful, couldn't it? Absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. It's a great starting place to understand, you know, how the rest of the world should function. And I didn't even, you know, I, I primarily speak from the Black experience because that's my own personal experience. But at least in the United States and in many parts of the world, you know, those conversations really also need to be rooted in 
the rights and justice for indigenous peoples who have been often tremendous stewards of the environment and of wildlife conservation for centuries, millennia, um, but may have been removed from landscapes in order to create conservation landscapes. And so there's a lot of dialogue and understanding and um, equity work and justice work that needs to be done alongside of wildlife conservation work. And it really all goes hand in hand so that human communities are protected and are thriving and are safe. And wildlife communities are too. It goes together. Yes, yes. And, and uh, would reiterate what you said about indigenous peoples and, and their communities and their incredible leaders in this part of the world in the Pacific Northwest when it comes to environmental challenges and, mm -hmm. and successes and, and you know, progress. It's, it's amazing to have them leading in, in, in many cases with things like grizzly bear recovery and on the mm -hmm. front lines of what is right, you know, for wildlife and nature and human beings. And I often just think, you know, and this is a, a process I'm going through as well of, of you know, I, 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 I feel incredibly privileged and I, I want to have the empathy to be able to feel somebody else's life and difficulties and struggles and journeys. And, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's something we can, all, we can all work on, right? You know, so Absolutely. I appreciate everything that you, you're doing, Ray, with it and uh, bringing it to light. And, and it's, it's an honor to talk to you about, about all of this. Is there a time or experience where you feel like you've been able to inspire somebody with a strong nature gene that might not have had an opportunity to act on it? Is there anything that stands out? Can you think of a, an example? Oh my gosh. Probably lots. I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> you've inspired so many people of color, especially to, to, to just dive in. Well, I have to say, I mean, I get, I, I'm very fortunate that social media exists because I get a lot of messages on social from people who have said exactly that, that I have served as an inspiration for them, just kind of for existing. Um, and that is really overwhelming. And I can't believe it because I get inspired by people, you know, today all the time. I, I mean, I feel like I'm just starting my career. And so it's amazing to hear that. Um, but absolutely, there was this full circle moment that I had um, because I first had my, my very first wildlife outdoors experience was as a college student on a study abroad program. And it was in, gosh, in 2014, I found myself teaching a study abroad program. I found myself being the professor for a wildlife ecology study abroad program. And so all of a sudden I had come full circle like, where yeah. <laughs> I was, I was, you know, teaching these students who had, you know, primarily never been in the wilderness. And we were in East Africa, we were in Kenya, you know, doing East African wildlife ecology. How, how did that feel being on that side of the Oh, it, it was amazing. I, I've written about it. I've, you know, I'm, I'm actually writing a bit of a memoir right now about a lot of these experiences. And, and it was really profound. It was incredibly profound. I couldn't believe it. Um, and there was one individual in that program in particular, a young black woman, you know, 19, 20, um, who was from the city, who wasn't sure if environmental science was the right major for her, you know, who really just wanted to travel and challenge herself. And she reminded me so much of me. And I got a message from her about last year saying that she was starting her PhD um, in wildlife ecology. And it was because of how meaningful our experiences together in Kenya were on that study abroad program. And so it's, uh -huh. I, I think about that a lot because even if there's just one more person who has found their place in this field because of something I said or did or taught or communicated, um, you know, that's worth it. And, and there are people. And, um, and again, I, I'm here because people on TV inspired me, you know, and made me feel like I had an interest in this and I could contribute. So, you know, we're all, we're all intertwined and we're building on each other. And it's, it's really, I, I'm so tremendously fortunate to love what I do and to have purpose in what I do and to see so many other people falling into it and loving it and excelling in it, doing better than I ever did. You know, it's, it's just wonderful. You know, the magic thing about it is about what you said is that was one example, but I'm sure there are just thousands of them out there of people you'll never hear from. I hope you sleep well at night, Ray. <laughs> 
it's the people you don't hear from that are also acting on the inspiration that you fed them. And it's, 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 it's very cool. Can we check out a couple of questions from some listeners here? Yes, Madison please. says, um, what careers in nature science or related fields would you recommend to somebody with physical limitations and isn't able to do field work? Oh, yes. Oh, I love this question. Yes. Um, you know, it's something that I am really challenging myself to do better at communicating about, you know, about people with varying abilities and how they might participate in a conservation work without necessarily being, you know, in the hiking boots in the field. And in particular, data science is, an, is a wonderful way to get involved because I've been talking about data, you know, here with you, Chris, and data, 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 data. When you have a lot of data and you want to figure out patterns in the environment, patterns in wildlife, having an understanding of data science um, is really, really helpful. And I'll give an example. So in particular, right now, you know, the site where I'm working has had camera traps up for a few years. And so we've been getting quite literally thousands, many thousands of images of different critters walking in front of the cameras. You know, wild pigs, squirrels, but also black bears and mountain lions and deer and all kinds of interesting animals. And the old way to do it would be to have one single person and look at each image and mark down what animal it was and the next image and mark down what animal it was. And then years later, you know, you get the results. <laughs> But these days, there's all these different machine learning techniques and different, you know, computer science programs and techniques where we can figure that out in a single day just by designing a computer program that's able to do that, doing the coding. Mm -hmm. um, so, so really having an understanding of technology, data science, and really those cutting edge, you know, tech fields can help wildlife conservation in ways that we never imagined years ago. And so I know that for a lot of students who might not be able to, you know, be out and about in the outdoors doing the field work, this is tremendously important, important even to my own projects. And so that's one example of something you can study or something you can learn on the side or volunteer with or participate with that can be enormously helpful. And it's really important that that gets communicated as well. Sitting okay. in front of a computer okay. can help yep. the environment. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, the thing that I, I, I hear a lot as well, and Madison, thanks for this question, because mm -hmm. it, it triggered this, this great conversation about, I, I think people look at uh, people who do field work, uh, and certainly I get it. It's like, even my, some of my best friends are like, oh, you're in town? Like, yeah, I'm in town a lot. <laughs> it's like, I'm behind, I'm behind that laptop a lot. There is a lot of home-based yeah. stuff needed, office-based stuff needed mm -hmm. to crank the machinery of conservation in the background, right? Whether it's fundraising or spreading messages on social media or doing data analysis like you're talking mm -hmm. about, Ray, or all of these things. Like for most field biologists, I'd guess it's 50% of their time, right? You know, so oh, sure. there's a lot more going on behind the scenes that people um, with this physical limitations, as Madison is asking about, uh, can, can get involved with. And it's as important as the field work itself, right? Absolutely. No doubt. And again, you know, education and, you know, and now we're doing so much right. virtual events, virtual education. I mean, anything like that. Statistics, like I said, art you know, fundraising, my goodness, I cannot do my research without the right funds. And the funds don't come from my pocket. They come right. from grants that from amazingly generous people donating money to organizations that I work with. And then some of that money goes to getting the equipment, paying for the field techs, you know, all of that is through grants. So fundraising yep. is a huge way. I mean, there's so many ways to get involved and we often glorify you know, the people like you and me, Chris, who are out in the field or have cubs in our hands. But really, there's so many folks who have too often been invisible, you know, in the conservation movement that really deserve so much credit and, and can be doing the work from home. Exactly. There's a lot of people behind the scenes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and there's a couple of really nice things here. Melissa says, just like ecosystems are healthiest when they are filled with diverse species. So will we as a yes. society be healthiest when we are filled with diversity? Wow. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Wynne Grant for sharing. That's really nice, Melissa, thank yeah. you. Um, uh, there's a question here from John. What outlets would you recommend for scientists to connect with communities, especially of color, and help establish a legacy of exploring and learning from the wild? Great question. 
Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, such a great question. And, you know, just to be specific, it's not necessarily, you know, scientists and communities of color that are separate. Scientists can also be from communities of color, right? So there is tremendous overlap. And that's a really important place to start, you know, to understand that it's not mutually exclusive. Um, but also, you know, there's a lot of really great organizations that I would love to recommend that do a lot of empowering. So it's, it's creating empowerment and leadership within communities of color. My favorite right now is Outdoor Afro. Outdoor Afro is an amazing organization led by someone who is my friend, Rue Mapp, who is such an innovator. She is a regular girl from Oakland who is just awesome and really empowering black and brown communities to be explorers, you know, near and far from home. There's also a lot of really great youth programs. One of my favorites is called City Kids Wilderness Project where kids from big cities on both of the coasts of the United States are brought every summer to Wyoming. And they have this intensive paid field summer where they are riding horses, they are going hiking, but they're also learning, they're being trained to be leaders in the outdoors. So when they come back home at the end of the summer, they didn't just have a great summer. They also have skills that will get them hired to have these wonderful careers in the outdoors. And there's many, many others, but those are two that I love to give a shout out to right now because I know a lot of the founders of them um, and I couldn't be more proud of what they do. That's great. That's great. Great recommendations, John. I hope that helps answer your question. And, and a, a lot of other people were probably thinking the mm -hmm. same thing. Um, We've just got a few more minutes left here, Ray, I, this, which is difficult because I could... Oh, I, <laughs> I could, could talk forever. I could really for talk all the time. <laughs> um, okay, so here's a scenario. A little 10-year-old girl comes up to you, tugs on your pants and asks, how can I do what you do? What do you tell her? Oh, my gosh. There's so many things to say. But I would say the first thing I say is, you know, decide whether an academic path school is the way you want to go. You know, I did a lot of school to become a wildlife ecologist, but it's not necessary. There are so many ways to be a scientist, to be a wildlife conservationist, and it doesn't require go doing tons and tons of school like I did. And in a lot of ways, you can get into those fields quicker if you don't spend all of your time in school. At the, with that said, some people excel in academia, and it's a great place for them to grow and develop as scientists or as conservationists. So I think that's a really big choice. And so I tell this little 10 year old girl, well, think about whether you wanna spend a lot of time in school learning, or if you wanna spend a lot of time out of school, you know, doing. And you can do both or you can do a hybrid or a mix and there's no wrong or right way to do it. But experience and just being out there is a great way. And starting with some volunteering, starting with some low level exploration. If you live in a town with a zoo, you know, figuring out like how you can spend some time in the zoo internship, the volunteer program, if, even if it's once a year, you know, really understanding where your passion lies is a great way. And then I also figuring out what you can level. do. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, figuring out what you can do. You know, when I was a kid, recycling was my thing. I cannot tell you enough. I was like kind of obsessed with recycling, but it was my thing at the time. <laughs> and really, I think in the environmental field, it's easy to feel overwhelmed, especially for young people, you know, like, well, which issue is my issue? And really, you know, kind of taking some time to feel it out. Is it oceans? Is it ocean plastics? Is it wildlife? Is it domestic or international endangered species or not? You know, there are so many different issues to be involved in and really exploring them using the internet. You don't, you don't have to spend your time outdoors to really find your passion. Um, and knowing that there isn't a rush, there's also a huge value in being a kid and being regular. And, you know, I was a waitress for years. You know, I didn't have the fancy internships in the environment. I, I worked at weighted tables all through college, even in my summers. You don't necessarily have to go above and beyond in order to be worthy and be important in the environmental movement. You have to have the ideas and the passion, but there's no necessarily like set protocol or set path to mm. getting there. So really okay. understanding that you don't have to necessarily sacrifice to be here. I think that's one of your most powerful messages. And I've heard you say it elsewhere as well, is that, is that 
break the rules, right? Mm -hmm. Bust down mm -hmm. the walls, mm -hmm. you know, throw aside the doors, just get out there and forge your own path because yeah. it's needed, it's enjoyable, it's urgent for the world right now. And, and we can each find our own path uh, at, at, at whatever level. I think back to what you said earlier on about your daughter and being small and like being focused on the things <laughs> right around her. You know? Yeah, and yeah. It's like, that's wonderful, right? You can encourage tiny kids. Hey, the exploration is, is two feet in front of you. That's it, right? Oh, you yeah. Know? I mean, think of how fascinating a ladybug is to a kid. Yeah. You know, that's all you need. <laughs> just just a little something. And there's the nature gene, right? It's like, God, I sometimes feel like we lose that nature gene. It's chipped mm -hmm. away the older we get. Mm -hmm. Society chips away at it. Don't let it, people. Don't right. let it chip away, you know. Just keep it intact by staring at ladybugs, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly it. I've got, I've got a last question for you, Ray. Yes. Um, let's face it, it all comes back to bears sooner or later, right? <laughs> Obviously. So I, I, would, I would ask you, what lesson have, have bears taught you about life, uh, about the world? Yeah, you know, uh, I, it may be obvious, but I'm a bit of an extrovert. And I have to say that bears have taught me kind of about the opposite, about the role of like finding that introvertedness in me. You know, in, in media, in books and stories and legends and cartoons and everything, we see bear families, mama bear, papa bear, baby bear, you know, all together. But, but in nature, bears are solitary and they're really happy that way. A mama bear will be with her cubs for a short time, but after that, they never see each other again. And that's normal and they're okay with that. They're okay being alone, being in solitude. Bears are very quiet. You know, they're not like wolves, they're not barking or howling. They're really quiet, really dignified, really solitary animals. And as a social person, as an extrovert, you know, that's definitely been a huge lesson to me that being with myself, you know, for long periods of time is great and it's wonderful. And I, I can be my own best friend in certain situations. And sometimes that's really gotten me through. And that is because of bears. I love that. I can't think of a better ending. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, they're great. They're the best. Bears are the best. I think you and I agree. <laughs> Go Bears. I totally agree. Yes. Thank you, Ray. So I've, I've so you. enjoyed this conversation on so many levels. You know, I feel like we've got so much in common and not just the bears mm -hmm. that we love. Um, and I so respect the work that you're doing to bring your passion to the world and to people everywhere. And uh, thank you for that. Thank and thank, thank you, for you Chris. Us today. This has been wonderful, Ray. Thank you. You are fantastic. You're a legend in your own right. And so I've been honored to chat with you and we'll do it again many times. That sounds great. Yes, let's make a habit of it. Yes. <laughs> Everybody, thanks for joining us. Dr. Ray Wynn Grant is a large carnivore ecologist and a fellow with National Geographic Society. And she's a legend. <laughs> Ray has an amazing Instagram account. Follow her adventures all over the world at Ray Wynn Grant. And be sure to follow our content at The Wild Pod and me at Chris Morgan Wildlife. The Wild is not inspired just by nature, but by people who work in it, love it, protect it. The Wild is a joint production of myself and KUOW Public Radio in Seattle with support from Wildlife Media. One way to help this vital work and become part of the wild community is through my wildlife organization, Chris Morgan Wildlife, on Patreon. There's a link in the show notes. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Mark and Rebecca Wilkins, Bob Yellowleaf, and Paul Lister. Our producer is Matt Martin. We had help with this event from Charlotte Durham, Bridget Anderson and Rob Springer. Jim Gates is our editor. Our production team includes David Brown, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Kara McDermott, Tio Popescu, Darcy Riggins Schmidt, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm your host, Chris Morgan. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoy The Wild, please do ask your friends to follow our podcast and maybe even give us a review. Thank you, and take good care. 